Ähm, ich freue mich, dass so viele dazugekommen sind. Also, ähm, wir haben das ganze Format noch ein bisschen umgebaut. Ähm, jetzt als Webinar, weil wir ähm, doch jetzt äh, Teilnehmer aus Luxemburg, Belgien, Österreich und Deutschland haben. Und äh, besonders freue ich mich, dass alle drei Weingüter, die wir heute äh, probieren werden, dazugekommen sind und auch live dabei sind, ähm, dann natürlich auch direkt etwas zu ihrem Wein selbst erzählen können, auch ein bisschen zu ihrer Philosophie. Das ist ähm, glaube ich, gerade bei diesen Weingütern sehr wichtig. Alo ist ähm, der Händler für diese drei Weingüter und für äh, noch mehr äh, Weingüter aus Südafrika, alle mit einer äh, sehr konkreten, kleinteiligen Philosophie äh, hinter ihren Weinen, die durchaus ein bisschen ab vom Mainstream ist in Südafrika. Ähm, und dadurch ein unheimlich interessantes Portfolio hat. Und ich hatte es ja schon ein bisschen versucht, in äh, die Veranstaltungsseite zu schreiben. Das Thema wird ein bisschen sein, ähm, Barrique-Ausbau, äh, Sponti bzw. Spontane, äh, spontane Fermentierung ähm, und Natural Wines, also wo stecke ich da die Grenzen ab, was ist der Unterschied zwischen Barrique und, und Holzausbau ähm, und auch was, äh, was macht denn eine Sponti oder spontane Verlierung aus, was kann ich mir darunter vorstellen äh, oder wie, inwieweit äh, beeinflusst das, das den Wein. Ähm, das kommt ein bisschen daher, dass ich äh, beobachtet habe, dass auch viele Gäste, die ich in meinem normalen Alltag, wenn nicht gerade wegen Corona alles geschlossen ist, begrüßen darf, immer noch ein bisschen Berührungsängste haben mit Holz oder auch barrique Weinen und die Definition von Natural und Orange Wines so ein bisschen verschwimmt und nicht ganz klar geregelt ist, was natürlich auch an den Weingesetzen der verschiedenen Länder liegt. Und das möchte ich so ein bisschen klären, auch ein bisschen die Berührungsangst nehmen, das war so die Idee dahinter. Wir haben drei ganz verschiedene Weine von drei wirklich wunderbaren Weingütern heute ausgesucht. Ja, ich glaube, das wird, wird ganz spannend. Peer wird gleich ein bisschen was zum technischen Ablauf sagen. Also wenn ihr Fragen habt, könnt ihr die immer stellen. Würde ich das Wort gerade an Peer übergeben, weil er hat auch noch ein paar... Ähm, Fragen äh, vorbereitet, die quasi so als äh, Question Answer Sheet vorbereitet sind. Gut, dann übernehme ich gerade mal das Wort ganz kurz. Ähm, ja, auch von meiner Seite ein ganz herzliches Willkommen. Äh, ich bin hier nicht der Fachmann für Südafrika, sondern ich bin letztendlich der, der kleine Techniker im Hintergrund. Daher auch von mir vor allem die technischen Erläuterungen. Ich habe gesehen, was schon ausprobiert worden ist, sehr erfolgreich. Es gibt unten in der Fußleiste von den Bildschirmen gibt es eine Chatfunktion. Da können wir alle miteinander chatten. Da kann man Sachen reinschreiben. Links daneben ist eine Funktion, nennt sich F und A, also Frage und Antwort. Dort könnt ihr Fragen reinstellen, weil ihr kein Mikrofon oder kein Video anhabt. Da könnt ihr dann Fragen reinstellen, die wir dann zum entsprechenden Zeitpunkt beantworten können, weil wir sehen die Fragen, die ihr hier stellt. Dann ist da unten noch eine Funktion, die nennt sich Handheben. Wenn man da drauf drückt, ich mache das mal parallel, dann kriegen wir hier eine Information, dass sich jemand meldet. Oh, der Wolfgang hat sich auch direkt gemeldet. Und so können wir dann sehen, okay, da ist eine Rückfrage oder irgendwas. Also alle möglichen Sachen sind dort möglich. Und was Shazad auch gerade schon erklärt hatte, wir fangen am Anfang jetzt einmal an mit einer kleinen Umfrage. Diese Umfrage machen wir anonym, weil es geht halt um verschiedene Geschichten, wie beispielsweise, wie häufig getrunken wird und so. Und da will sich ja vielleicht nicht jeder unbedingt öffentlich outen. Also ich starte jetzt diese Umfrage, die angezeigt wird. Es sind vier Fragen. Äh, antwortet ruhig und dann ähm, kann ich im Anschluss die anonyme Auswertung dieser äh, Umfrage mal reinbringen. Wenn ihr euch wundert, dass ich immer wieder beiseite schaue, ich habe hier auch mehrere Geräte stehen ähm, und 
habe, bin letztendlich als Gast auch dabei, einfach um zu sehen, äh, was ihr seht, nicht nur, was wir aus Moderatorensicht aus sehen. Guys from South Africa, you can join, huh? These questions, just answer these questions if you like. Kleiner Hinweis noch, uh, short notice, um, der Livestream uh, funktioniert da dann nicht. Ich habe es auch versucht auf einer Seite zu machen, irgendwie uh, will, will das nicht so, wie wir das wollen. So, 91 Prozent der äh, Teilnehmer haben die Fragen beantwortet. Ich warte noch mal so zehn Sekunden und dann beende ich die Antwort. Äh, ja, alle haben geantwortet. Super. Dann werde ich mal die Umfrage beenden. Und das ist ähm, das Ergebnis. Ähm, for our friends from South Africa, the first question is, how often do you drink wine? Äh, 58% say uh, daily, uh, the rest says several times the week. Oh, that's not too bad, come on. Um, then the second question, do you have already experience with natural or orange wines? Um, and the answers are 83% yes, good um, uh, results. 8% uh, says, ah, yes, I, I have some experience, but not good ones. And 8% one per, uh, says, Uh, no experience at all. Then we have the third question, which is uh, concerning the um, fermentation. Uh, is this um, um, sponti, the, this spontaneous fermentation known for you? Uh, 92% say yes, which, which is fantastic. And the last question, do you like to drink uh, Uh, wines which are with a uh, very clear note of barrique of, of oak taste. Uh, 75% say yes, 25% say no. So this was our uh, first um, uh, poll and now I think we can continue with Arlo so he can uh, present the winemakers. Now again, hi everybody, welcome from Berlin. And um, first of all, thank you for Shasat. Three weeks ago, he called me and shared his idea to, to make something, um, something on the internet. Thank you for all the work and organization, also Pear huh, for support uh, all this, the technic stuff, especially sitting there with five computers. <laughs> And yeah, hello to South Africa. Uh, I start with Jan, go from north to south. Um, I met Jan, I think 15 years ago. He's doing um, wines on the West Coast, an area what's not so popular for um, wine in general, more for brandy coke, huh? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> But wine these yeah. days, a lot of wine, a little bit inland. Not on the coast, um, we are the only ones on the coast, but a lot on the inland side. Yeah, so Jan is, uh, has an interesting winery, it's right on the ocean, right on the cold, cold Atlantic Ocean. He's specialized on Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir, and he's doing also Shiraz and um, yeah, some other varieties. Today we will taste the Shiraz. Very nice winery, um, cool climate, very interesting wines. Then we come to Craig from Testa Longa Wines. He's in the popular Swartland area, but he's in the absolutely north part of this area. And um, yeah, for me, he's a, he's a leader when it comes to natural wine in South Africa. He's um, doing natural wine since a long time, not only since a couple of years, where it's a big thing. He's doing that for a long, long time and we will taste his um, Follow Your Dreams um, red wine. And uh, last but not least, David. David is uh, from the Trafford Wines. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very nice winery from Stellenbosch. It's more well known, um, but he's also right on the, on the mountain, we will see later, and doing um, 
since uh, from the from the beginning on wines on a on a very handcrafted way. He pressed everything by 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 hand press, and he still filled the bottles by hand and labeled the bottles by hand. So I think there are not so much wineries in the world they do so much uh, handwork and handcrafted wines. So yeah. Hello to South Africa and thanks that you are here. Huh? And uh, cheers. Geht zurück am Pferd. Jo, danke dir, ähm, Arlo. Ich würde sagen, wir starten jetzt mal mit der Präsentation, die von äh, Shazad gemacht wird, beziehungsweise ich blende sie ein und äh, Shazad wird dazu äh, singen. Nein, er äh, wird dazu sich äußern. <lacht> Kleine Sekunde. Genau, also singen werde ich äh, hoffentlich nicht. Also vielleicht, wenn ich alle Faschen gelehrt habe, aber vorher, vorher nicht. Ähm, bevor wir weitergehen, ähm, wer ihn noch nicht kalt gestellt hat, wer den äh, Hinweis vielleicht vorher nicht gesehen hat, ich hatte auf Facebook noch mal geschrieben, den Doring Bay Shiraz bitte unbedingt noch mal in den Kühlschrank stellen. Ähm, ideale äh, Serviertemperatur 10 Grad, das wäre auch äh, zu empfehlen, weil einfach sich der, der Charakter vom Wein grundlegend ändert. Ich würde jetzt einfach noch ein kurzes Kunstpäuschen machen, bevor wir dann äh, eigentlich starten, damit jeder noch mal schnell zum Kühlschrank äh, laufen kann. Ähm, eine Person hat es leider noch nicht geschafft, in äh, den Chat zu kommen. Wir schauen mal, ob sie jetzt noch kurz dazu kommt. Äh, das wäre ideal. Ansonsten ähm, haben wir eine schön gemischte Gruppe. René aus Israel äh, schaut uns äh, zu. Thomas sitzt in äh, Österreich. Äh, Daniel sitzt an der Grenze zu Luxemburg. Äh, Marie-Louise und ihr Freund sitzen in Belgien. Und der Rest äh, schaut uns äh, aus Deutschland zu. Und natürlich die Winzer aus Südafrika. Also, ähm, tja, da sieht man mal, was der Lockdown äh, in Europa auch für positive Auswirkungen hat, wie klein die Welt auf einmal wird. Die Idee zu dem Tasting gerade für südafrikanische Weine entstand eigentlich auch aus dieser Situation heraus. Ähm, gerade die letzten Zahlen von der Wirtschaft äh, haben gesagt, dass in Deutschland der Weinkonsum steigt, seit äh, alles zu ist. Ganz interessant, auch äh, durchaus zu begrüßen. Ähm, in Südafrika sieht das Ganze ein bisschen anders aus. Äh, die Situation ist, äh, dass man selbst noch nicht mal Wein verkaufen darf. Das heißt, die Weingüter sitzen absolut auf ihrer Ware, können auch nicht mal per Post äh, Weine versenden, weil sie einfach nichts verkaufen dürfen. Und das ist natürlich eine unheimliche Belastung. Ähm, Alo ist auch äh, selbstständig, hat das Projekt komplett äh, aus seiner Energie heraus ins Leben gerufen und ist auch einfach darauf angewiesen, dass er, wenn wir Gastronom jetzt äh, aktuell äh, nichts verkaufen dürfen, dass äh, ein bisschen äh, Weine quasi direkt an die Endkunden quasi verkauft werden und wir die zu Hause trinken. Und das ist, äh, wenn das gar nicht möglich wäre, so wie in Südafrika, wäre das die ganze Situation sicherlich noch etwas schwieriger, als, die, als sie so schon ist. Und das war so die ursprüngliche Idee dahinter. Und ähm, ich arbeite mit Adria ja schon sehr lange zusammen, kenne sein Portfolio ein bisschen und darum habe ich äh, mir heute gedacht, Gehen wir mal nach Südafrika und suchen so ein bisschen die Weine, die man vielleicht nicht auf dem Schirm hat. Jeder denkt oft, ähm, Südafrika sind die Südhalbkugel kurz unter Äquator, gar nicht so kurz, aber äh, man assoziiert das doch immer mit sehr äh, warmen, heißen Klima. Ähm, das ist gar nicht so sehr. Wer ähm, will vielleicht zum nächsten Slide wechseln können? Uh, Arno sitzt in Berlin, absolute One-Man-Show mit einem sehr ambitionierten Portfolio. Uh, ich sehe gerade, Elke ist auch online endlich. Das hat scheinbar funktioniert, das freut mich sehr. Hallo Elke, schön, dass Hallo, du dabei bist. Schaut, die Sabine hat auch noch gefragt, ob sie das richtig verstanden hat, dass die Rotweine bei 10 Grad gekühlt, auf 10 Grad gekühlt werden sollten. 
der erste Rotwein, also der zweite Wein, Doran Bay Shiraz von Friars Cove, unbedingt äh, runterkühlen. Das ist, das ist der falsche Wein, Per, entschuldige. Äh, <lacht> du hast äh, immer die Tipp. Der Doran Bay Shiraz, wenn ihr die Zeit dafür noch habt, bitte noch mal kurz im Kühlschrank stellen, dass wir wirklich bei 10 Grad äh, probieren können. Das, das verändert wirklich den Charakter vom Wein. Genau. Ähm, von Simone kam gerade eine, eine Meldung per Hand. Äh, Sehe ich gerade. Genau. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, Per schaut danach, ob er, ähm, wenn da Fragen sind. Äh, Ado sitzt in Berlin, ambitioniertes Portfolio südafrikanischer Weine. Ich selbst bin, äh, wenn ich nicht gerade in Zwangspause bin, in Luxemburg. Äh, das Bild hier ist relativ Alt, äh, Restaurant Lea Linster, ultra klassische französische Küche, ähm, recht großer Weinkeller, äh, zurzeit so um die 5.500, 6.000 Flaschen äh, verteilt auf die ganze Welt. Und äh, seit etwa anderthalb Jahren, ich bin seit zwei Jahren da, seit anderthalb Jahren auch mehr und mehr Weine, Natural äh, oder Spondi oder auch Orange, ein bisschen was Ambitionierteres, um so ein bisschen in den Kontrast zu setzen zwischen klassischer französischer Küche und modernen Wein. Per ist äh, Präsident der Sommelier Union Deutschland, ist äh, für nicht nur Deutsche, sondern auch für alle deutschsprachigen Sommeliers sicherlich eine der wichtigen Anlaufstellen, auch was unser internes Networking betrifft. Wir können uns schnell austauschen. Und vielen Dank nochmal, Per, an dich an dieser Stelle, dass du so ein bisschen die technische Moderation heute übernimmst und äh, dabei bist und die Zeit nimmst in deinem Homeoffice. Äh, das freut mich auch sehr. Sehr, sehr gerne. Um, I guess we're going to switch to English. If there are any uh, questions, uh, please just uh, note them in the toolbar. You can just always ask uh, us directly if there's anything you don't understand. We switch to the next slide, uh, showing you South Africa. South Africa um, was quite big uh, compared to Germany and uh, Southern Hemisphere. So actually, um, it's uh, you could the harvest is done already, and they're preparing now for the next growing season. So it's like going to winter now, more or less. Um, and on the next page, uh, slide, you can see it's a bit strange in South Africa, the wine growing is decreasing. So less wines are produced in the last years in South Africa. Um, but that's for a good reason. At least the quality is rising up. So we have less wines, but higher quality and more individual growers and more Uh, different styles and uh, what's really surprising uh, we as uh, European we all think okay in South Africa you should have like uh, very uh, intense heavy wines should be very hot we always remember South Africa as a hot climate and uh, but it's exactly the opposite why this uh, South Africa um, is surrounded by the ocean and um, by some streams from the from the water, which are chilling the all the area down. And this results uh, that we have more white wines than red wines planted uh, all over South Africa. And the style of wine is usually uh, much fresher, much lighter, as we would uh, imagine if we if we think about. For the first wine, we're going to switch to Stellenbosch, uh, one of the regions, I guess, everybody has already heard from or maybe know some wines from. One of the most important regions for wine growing. We have wine growing in South Africa already since the 17th century. So it's very, very long time. But of course, the, the type of wine growing there uh, Change a lot since then. One of the most important markets for South African wines today is uh, Germany, usually on 
number two or three, but UK is leading uh, still. You can see after Brexit if it's still like this, or maybe Germany taking over. Um, so a lot of wines from South Africa go directly to, to export markets. It's usually quite a third of uh, the amount of wines getting to just export markets. The Trefford wines, uh, you can see is uh, in the south of the city of uh, Stellenbosch. And um, because Stellenbosch is the most planted grape variety in South Africa, and I like it very, very much, it's one of my absolutely favorite grape varieties uh, in the world. Um, I choose the Chenin Blanc from the Trefford first. And it's a bit unusual style for Chenin Blanc, I would say. And uh, this one is uh, labeled as Sponti or spontaneous uh, fermentation. Uh, for those who are not aware about this uh, spontaneous fermentation, if, if we talk about this, uh, we're talking about no added yeast because usually if you go for wine preparing, you would like to add a preset of yeast for a specific result and for a very fast uh, fermentation period. Um, but if you work carefully in your renewed, if you don't use too many pesticides or uh, chemistry at all, you can preserve the yeast growing on the grape skin to afterwards uh, fermenting the wine. Pierre, when you to the next slide, um, we can uh, see now the Trafford wines is um, fitted between the mountains. It's quite interesting area. Um, which is really protecting the wines because sometimes the winds blowing from the sea can be very harsh and very tough. Um, and if you would like to prepare wines with less alcohol, you would higher to the mountains. And um, then I would like to take uh, David over to explain a bit of your philosophy, what's your idea about your wines and what you're doing? <clears throat> um, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Shastad, and, and um, hi to, to all the listeners or followers, I'm not sure what you call them, um, in Germany. Um, yeah, we in, in lockdown as well now, it's quite tough on, the, um, on our industry. Um, not allowed to export and we're not allowed to sell wine um, in South Africa at the moment. Uh, but yes, we, I'm actually an architect originally by training and uh, wine was really a hobby. Um, and we have this farm, as you can see, beautifully situated um, about 400 meters above sea level in the mountains between the Stellenbosch mountain and uh, the Helderberg mountain. Um, so I learned about winemaking really through trial and error. And in 1989, I worked a harvest in, in saint Emilion in France. And I saw there that, you know, uh, they never added uh, yeast uh, just um, at, the, at the Chateau Souta that I worked. Um, and in South Africa at that time, it was very kind of winemaking was extremely technical everything was you know there's use of centrifuges and filtration and and using natural yeast was pretty unheard of and i just kind of saw that it was one less thing to buy it was yeast so i thought i'd give it a try and it worked perfectly it just took a couple of days longer to get going and that's what we've done every ever since you know other winemaking colleagues have said to to me you know you're going to you're going to, you know, you're heading for trouble, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes we do have some lagging ferments, um, uh, but it's, it's a small percentage, you know, um, maybe three or four percent. And, um, and I think what it gives us, especially in the Chenin Blanc, um, which sits on the lease for quite a, for nine months or so, you get a whole lot of species of, of, types of yeast and um, and that adds to the complexity of the wine a lot of the character comes from the lease 
And so I think in particular, the Chenin Blanc benefits from this uh, spontaneous fermentation. I think more so than the reds where, you know, a lot of flavor comes from the skins um, at great intensity, probably, you know, um, dominates the, the subtleties of, of, of using natural yeast, but, but I think it still plays a role. And, um, and you know, there, there's also quite a debate about what yeast you have in your cellar and what comes from the vineyard. But I think it's, it's both. We definitely see ferments happening differently from different blocks uh, we get our grapes from. Uh, so also just to explain, um, we only have a small five hectare vineyard and um, it's planted exclusively to red grapes. We're on a north facing slope, so that faces the sun in the southern hemisphere. Uh, we're quite nicely sheltered from, from, the, um, from the wind. Uh, so although we're high up, we still get, it's still quite a warm um, ripening period, which gives us quite big, intense red wines. Um, but uh, for the Chenin Blanc, I started this in 1995. Um, you know, as, as mentioned before, there's so much Chenin Blanc around. It seemed silly. We didn't have the ideal slopes, in my view, for Chenin Blanc. So uh, we started off buying grapes from, from our neighbors. And that's what we continue to do. And uh, so we get from basically about three different farms. Um, the one block is, is a fairly young vineyard that I encouraged uh, our neighbors to buy. It's a beautiful block, about 11 years old. And then the other two are around about 35 years old. Uh, the, the really the, the thing that the common denominator is that they're all low yielding vines. Um, and we've always done, basically we don't have uh, any tanks uh, in our cellar. We do everything in barrels. Um, it's not to say that that's necessarily the best way of doing things, but it's, it's kind of our way. And I see really the barrels as, as an, a nurturing environment. It's uh, not about adding flavor to the wine. That's not what we try and do. We try, it's like a, you know, a cot for, the, for a baby. It's, it's, it's something that, that cradles and nurtures the wine. And, um, and you get that slow, uh, oxidation, that slow interaction with oxygen, and especially with the Shannon sitting on the lees, uh, you get that, that uh, complexity of flavor from, from the yeast, the yeast autolysis, uh, which also keeps the wine quite fresh. Uh, we have to taste fairly regularly to see that it doesn't become reductive, become kind of stinky, in which case we give it a little bit of a stir or take a bit of wine out and, and add it back to the wine. Um, and generally we, yeah, we don't filter. Um, so my approach was just to make the wine naturally. You know, when I started out, it wasn't, there wasn't really any such thing as natural wine as such. So I, I did, I, we sort of half sit in the natural wine category, I, I suppose, to some extent. But it's not really, um, my thing is really to make the wine as sensitively as environmentally sensitive as possible. Um, I think it's necessary for fine wine, whether you're organic or not, to be really in tune with nature. And whether one uses, say, a copper spray or some sort of synthetic spray to, 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 to guard your vineyard, I don't think it makes a huge difference. It's more the philosophy of trying to do as little as possible, um, only what is necessary uh, to make the best possible wine. So um, just to also mention my wife, um, is an artist, she does the labels. Each year it's a different label. So the one that's on the picture is the 2014 and the 2017, uh, there we go, is a little bit different. Um, yeah, you can see it there. So this is actually one of her silk scarves. She does these eco-printed silk scarves. Um, and yeah, as I say, each, each year a different label. So um, yeah, we use very little new oak, just about 10% just to replace some barrels that maybe, you know, aren't, aren't giving such good results and so on. So 
for us, using uh, barrels is not about adding flavor, but more about you know yeah, the wine evolving in in the in the barrel, and it does give a certain style to the wine. And um, it's not to say that tank fermented isn't isn't good or fermenting in concrete eggs and all those things are, are fantastic. You know, I think there's lots of ways of of making fine wine, of making great wine. But as a small winery, we kind of stick to our kind of way that's consistent over the years and um, and try and you know respond to each vintage in the best way possible. So um, yeah, I don't know if I'm <laughs> talking too much now. So. Uh, no, you're not talking too much. It's <laughs> perfectly. Um, but there's a, just Simone, uh, she asked a very big question. Uh, I was curious about this as well. Uh, she did ask, are there any information how long the lockdown in South Africa and as well the ban of selling your wines, uh, how long uh, does it will take? Uh, it will take? Uh, we don't. Well, uh, while I'm on the line, I'm also on. So we don't really know. The lockdown officially is, a, is until the end of April. Um, but it's, it's very unlikely that they're going to unban the sale of wine in South Africa. But we're hoping that in the next few weeks, even before the lockdown, that they rethink the exporting thing because it, it, it's really quite silly. It's got nothing to do with infecting people, you know, the spreading the virus and so on. So it's really more uh, a logistical thing that the police feel they can't kind of, um, you know, handle the hijacking of, of vehicles delivering alcohol and so on. So, yeah, we, we, we don't really know, but um, certainly for sale of, of wine and alcohol in South Africa, I think it'll be at least three weeks. Uh, but hopefully sooner that we can export wine because there are also 300,000 people dependent on the wine industry in South Africa. So, um, you know, I think in our situation here, uh, poverty and, um, and the, you know, fragile healthcare system and all those things are, are a problem. And, um, you know, we have to try and keep the economy going as well because that can be, uh, really cause more fatalities than than the virus itself in 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 a sort of South African and African situation. Yes, I believe it's even hard for us in, in Europe with the restaurants locked down and uh, it's tough for us, tough for um, uh, people like Arlo trading wine and importing wine and selling it, us, uh, it to us. So, I believe. Well, we hope <laughs> it will be uh, better soon for all of us. But even with the sh first chain of law, it's uh, the point I would like to mention a bit. Uh, this one was matured in very sized barrels as well in bigger oak barrels. Um, just to mention it, Barik, uh does not mean only oak, it means as well a specific size of oak. It's very small barrel, not the smallest, but very small with only 225 liters um, per barrel, which is very small and making it a very big surface for the wine to interact directly with the oak. And uh, a lot of people are thinking, okay, yeah, it's has been in Berwick, it's gonna taste only uh, from oak and gonna be very tough and very oaky tannins. Um, but uh, if I'm right, you're not using only uh, new oak. Um, so maybe you can explain a bit what's the difference between fresh Berwick sized or oak barrels and uh, used ones. Because uh, if I'm right, you're using a lot of like used oak, second and third uh, used uh, and bigger oaks as well? Uh, yes, we, we basically, I mean, ideally I don't really want any new oak, but, um, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the barrel is also a, a natural thing and, um, you know, we need to replace some barrels. So in general, we, it, it usually amounts to less than 10%. 
um, of the barrels on you. And so we, but we also use 400 liter and 700 liters. So we've been increasing the, the amount of uh, 400 and 700 liter barrels. Um, so most of the new oak component has been those bigger barrels. So, you know, it's generally the new oak, barrel in the 225 is maybe like for me the worst of all our barrels um, and um, because it is a bit too too oaky but it represents you know a, a tiny percentage of the blend so um, but you know so so I think also that the different size barrels um, has quite a significant effect as well so we get basically three different types of wine as well as each barrel itself being of different age and then getting from different blocks so um they're very i would say almost there are no two barrels that are the same so um it ends up being being quite a, a complex uh, mix the disadvantage of the bigger containers is that it generates a bit more heat so you get a little bit warmer from it but we're talking of a couple of degrees here and there we don't have cooling in our cellar um, we just have a really basic sort of air conditioner at the upper level so the whole cellar is sort of is about 18 degrees uh, celsius or less as it, the, the cell is also on on different levels. So lower down where we ferment the Shannon, it's generally about 16, 17 degrees. Um, and our ferments do take quite a long time. Um, some of the barrels take at least nine months to finish. And there are always a few that also don't finish in time that we do the bottling. So sometimes, uh, in fact, most often there's about five or 10% of the previous vintage in 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 the wine so in other words the 2017 might have about five percent of the 2016 so so some of the wine was even longer in barrel um so yeah it's our style i think tasting the 2017 you, you can barely notice any I, I don't really pick up any specific oak flavors in the wine um but it does have a barrel matured character to some extent um you know it tastes i think if you if you taste the wine as a as a technical taster you would know that it's seen it's been in barrels rather than tank fermented as such it's not kind of one it's not so primary it's got quite layered flavor and and quite a a texture that you also get from barrel aged um, wine I don't know if you have seen, David, there are two specific questions uh, to you about your Chenin Blanc. The first one is uh, from Simone. Uh, she's asking, uh, could you explain how was explicit difficult in 2017? And the second question uh, is from Florian. Um, it's about uh, your vineyard a bit more. Uh, he is asking, are your Chenin Blanc vineyards very windy because of the valley location and the close location to the sea? Um, so I'm not quite sure the first question about 2017, was it difficult? Is that referring to the drought or...? Um, I guess so, yes, but... Oh, okay, well, the, uh, I'll explain. For me, 2017 is a, is a wonderful vintage. Um, 2015 and 2016 were, especially 2016 was extremely uh, drought uh, vintage or year. Uh, 2017 was, was fairly normal and it was a little cooler over the harvest period. So in general, I would say the wines are a little more elegant, have a nice acidity, um, a very good vintage for us. 2016 was, was a much more difficult vintage. Um, the, the situation of the drought really became more of a problem in 2017, basically because of the city. Um, to, it was the third kind of dry year and the city started running out of water. So 
uh, from the, what the public see as the drought year was really 2017, but in actual fact, it was more 2016. So um, for us, it was, was a fantastic uh, vintage. Um, the vineyards we get grapes from, yes, one of them is more on the fir grove side, which is quite close to the sea. It does get a lot of wind. And um, I think, uh, well, like a constant breeze, not like damaging wind so much. Um, but one of the things uh, that, and I think it's one of the reasons why Chenin Blanc is planted uh, in the Cape and, and does so well here, is that, um, is that it's, it's extremely wind resistant. Um, and um, yeah, so, so you know, it, it, it handles the wind really well. Um, the other block is closer to us in the valley and that is a bit more sheltered, but it's a trellis vine vineyard. Um, so the grapes are quite high off the ground, um, younger block. So it's also planted, being a younger vineyard, <clears throat> it was planted especially for quality. A lot of Chenin Blanc was really planted for kind of easy drinking wine and, and not really a lot of thought in terms of quality was put into the vineyards whilst um you know more recently and in this vineyard in particular was was basically designed for quality it, everything was was done really well it, especially the clonal selections are are good really low yielding small bunches uh, small natural yields um and a great flavor so we get something special out of the older vines that have come into lower production due to the fact of its vine age and we also get something uh, special out of the younger vines that are really kind of designed for quality as as it were you know um, okay yeah I don't know that's the question uh, I guess uh, quite well um, well for me this Chambon uh, represents um, or is a good to, uh, example of uh, what Shannon Ball can be. Um, it uh, can reach a lot of complexity with uh, uh, fermenting in oaks and buttery flavor and quite complex and full body with buttery and creamy flavors, but still having um, fresh, nice acidity and uh, keeping the balance uh, in the wine and that's uh, why it makes for me uh, one of the most interesting uh, grape varieties um, in the world. Um, of course uh, I didn't mention it but uh, feel free to drink and taste your wine while we are talking about <laughs> uh, I guess uh, I don't need to say that you should open the bottles uh, so I hope everybody already tastes it um about the wines and there's one more question for you david uh, about the soil from thomas uh, he's uh, joining from austria he's uh, asking what's the soil your wine is growing on uh it's mostly decomposed granite um hutton type soil um we yeah they're quite quite deep quite stony but not extremely stony what's good about these soils uh, which are fairly typical in the Stellenbosch, the sort of mid, uh, mid altitude kind of soils, um, is that they have a, a good clay content. They can be quite vigorous in places, so it's really having the, the right balance of enough clay in the soil, but without too much vigor. So, because, um, you know, we do have a, a long uh, summer, uh, with very little rain. So, so you want quite a lot of clay in the soil and these soils uh, give that to us. So in general, um, in the Western Cape, you have more at the lower levels and more kind of shale uh, based soils. And then um, the sort of mid slopes of the mountains, you have mostly granitic based soils. And then above that uh, sandstone, but of course as well, the weathering of the sandstone moves down the slopes so the soil also includes a lot of sandstone a degree of quartz um, but for us one of the key things is is to have 
you know, in Europe where you have a lot of, right, or Northern Europe anyway, you know, it's important to have really good drainage. That's also, you know, to some extent important, but for us having a good deep uh, soils with good water holding capacity is really crucial. We do um, some of the vineyards, um, it, the, some of the Shannon vineyards aren't irrigated, but uh, some are. Um, but I, I do feel that, that it helps quite a bit to, to add a little bit of water um, at the kind of veraison stage, just to help the vines through. So wherever we can, we, we do do that. Um, so yeah, I hope that asks, uh, answers the question. Yes, I guess that's quite good. Um, there's one more or two more questions at least, but then we're done and then afterwards we're going to switch to the next uh, um, wine. Um, Thomas as well is uh, asking what are the age of the wines, uh, how deep they grow and one more, what are the white wines you're growing? Um, okay, so the, the one vineyard is 11 years old and the other two vineyards are around about 35 years old. We don't know how deep the roots go, um, but, you know, probably not much more than two meters, I think. But, um, yeah, that's also quite a debatable thing, um, how much influence uh, you know, most of the vine's nutrients are taken up in the, the like 99% from the top sort of meter or so. So anyway, but that that's that's a sort of whole nother topic that th there's not much kind of science about. Um, so yeah, we don't really know how deep the roots go. Um, but yeah. And the last, the final question of Thomas was, uh, what other wines uh, do you grow? Probably. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> as I say, the, the Chenin Blanc, we, we buy grapes from, from our neighbors or, or nearby vineyards. Um, on our vineyard, we mostly uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah, um, that, and, and a little bit of Merlot, which is a little bit lower down where we have slightly richer soil. Uh, more clay, so that's a bit more ideal for Merlot, and a little bit of Cabernet Franc as well. So our signature kind of estate wine is called Elevation 393. It's a blend of all four varieties, although sometimes not, yeah, we, it varies quite a bit from year to year, but um, it's usually based on Cabernet Sauvignon. And then we do uh, two Syrahs. One is a single vineyard Syrah from the same vineyard, and the other is the Blueprint Syrah, which is mostly from our neighbor's vineyard on very similar soil, slightly richer soil. Um, and we do a Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon as well. So Cabernet is, is really, the Cabernet Sauvignon and our um, Chenin Blanc are two sort of main, uh, what our, our biggest sort of producers, but it's only about a thousand cases each. So our total production is about three and a half thousand cases. It's really tiny. We do everything in a little basket press, um, as I say, unfiltered, um, hand-picked, of course. And um, we also have quite narrow rows, which is a little bit unusual in South Africa. Uh, but I believe in that. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of, kind of it. <laughs> Okay, thank you so so much for for the explanation. Um, I guess we're going to switch to the next wine first. I would like to mention we are switching to Doring Bay, which is part of Olifants River, which is quite far in the north of South Africa. And that's very important uh, because this results in the most uh, coolest climate and. Um, I say uh, most fresh and slim body wines you can find in South Africa. You see it's directly at the sea. Um, it's very important. Um, 
it's very flat area and I'm, I'm very sorry in the presentation uh, I prepared <laughs> South Africa it's not in this corner it's not that very touristic and not so interesting for so many companies so it's not that perfectly mapped by Google because <laughs> If you compare this to the Californian section in Google, it would have been um, mapped perfectly, but you, but I guess it's enough to see. Um, we're directly at the sea. That's very important um, for the members of the tasting. I give you a few moments to go quickly to the fridge, take out the shiras. Should be chilled now by 10 degrees to be served. Um, because it's completely changing the style of wine you're, you're going to enjoy if it's more chill than if it's warm. And um, after this, um, two minutes maybe, uh, I would like to ask Jan to explain especially um, why you're located directly at the sea? What's uh, the connection between the sea and your fermenting process? Um, there's a like, hidden secret, not everybody does this. Uh, but, well, I guess you know what I mean. And uh, for me, it's a very surprising style of Shiraz, um, especially in South Africa. Um, I didn't imagine this uh, style of very fresh, slim bodied and elegant style of Shiraz is not too heavy and something completely different as you would regularly find it in, in Europe or Central Europe. Just as I mentioned, one, two minutes and we're gonna, mm -hmm. then you can start to explain about your idea and your philosophy. All right, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. And um, yes, I'm first going to start and explain a little bit of, um, of why we were so mad to plant a vineyard where we are situated. Um, it started as a dream in 1985. Um, I was then still at school and um, we were talking, my, me, myself, my father and my brother-in-law about, um, about cool climate wine production. Um, and that, that whole concept stuck with me. And in 1990, I finished studying winemaking and I decided I had to do something about it. And eventually I bought a piece of land next to Strandfontein. If you see in the photo, you will see where the cellar is. And that's in Durang Bay, but the next town, it's, it's in the slide as it turns around. You will see a town called Strandfontein. And Strandfontein, the name for the German people or for the other people um, that's that's looking at the at the slide. Um, Strandfontein means uh, a fountain on the beach, and there was a little town established there because it was the only place that there was a little bit of water. But it's very brackish water, so um, so when we started the, the the idea, we knew that we wouldn't have water um, to irrigate. And as you will see also in the slide, um, it's a semi-desert area. Although it's a very cool, um, almost cold area influenced by the cold Atlantic Ocean, um, it's a very dry area. We get about 45 millimeters of rain uh, per year. Now, um, most of you will say, it's, uh, then that's sometimes rain that you will get in one day or maybe in one hour. We get it in a year, so, so we need to irrigate. And for that, we had to build a pipeline from a farm of mine in, in the Friendal area, which is on the Willifans River. I had to build a pipeline for 29 and a half kilometers uh, to bring fresh water over to the ocean. And then we started planting vineyards there, but um, I can only plant six hectares with the, with the volume of water I have available. So our first planting was uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir, which is the two cultivars that, that does well in cool areas. Um, and we immediately saw that it's doing well and what we expected um, is happening. Uh, we, get, we get prominent flavors and you have a long ripening season. So we thought of expanding the, the, the range and we thought about doing a Shiraz. And the, the, the soil that the Shiraz is planted on is it's red sandy soil on top, but it's heavy limestone bottom layers. 
which is actually fantastic for Shiraz production. And from the first grapes that we harvested of the Shiraz, we found that it was exceptionally um, good quality. And because of a long ripening period, when it's cool, you have a long ripening period, you have lots of time for flavors to develop. Um, so that's, uh, the, that's the, the story behind and the dream behind it um, is, is that nature must take its course and, and do what it needs to do to create the flavors, to create the, the, the quality we want. We want to do as, as, um, as less possible uh, influence. And the nice thing also being so close to the ocean is that we get um, the little salt flakes uh, out of the wind. The, the closest part of our vineyards are 600 meters from the shoreline. And we have a lot of wind coming directly from the ocean. That's the, the, the prevailing winds. And, and the, the sea spray, it evaporates and the, this little salt flake carries on. So that goes onto the vineyard and it sticks to the leaves. Um, and that is a good advantage to us because no fungus disease likes to sit on that leaf where there's salt on the leaf. And if you, right before harvesting, um, you can actually take the oldest leaves and you can lick it and you can taste the salt on the leaves. In the beginning, we were a little bit worried about the influence of the salt, but uh, eventually we found that the vineyards adapted to that. And uh, today you don't have any, any visible influence of the salt. Maybe sometimes uh, early winter, you will get that some of the leaves will get a little bit of leaf burn from that salt salt but that's because of the mist coming in every afternoon and it wetens that salt and the leaf then takes it up um, which can give a little bit of leaf burn but it's then at that stage it's post harvest so we're not really worried about that so everything is done in a in, in absolute as natural as possible and then in uh, 2010 we had the privilege to move into the old harbor buildings in Durang Bay uh, the fishing industry absolutely collapsed so during Bay, there was, there was a lot of poverty. Uh, people didn't have work. Um, and it's a small, small uh, town. So at least we started our, our, our winery there. And um, we went so far as to use the sea temperature, which is absolutely cold, uh, between 11 and, and uh, 16 degrees. Um, we use that as part of our cooling system in the winery. Uh, just for fermentation on the on the white wines and the red wines like the Shiraz, no ferment or no temperature control needed because the cellar is cold enough inside. It's sometimes so cold that we even we are even having problems with malolactic fermentation, which is the secondary fermentation, um, which most of the time happens naturally. But if it's too cold, we need to inoculate a little bit. Um, yeah, so in 2010, we moved into the, into the winery and at least we could um, offer some jobs to the local people. And we have very um, loyal people working there for us. And uh, it's, it's a shame that now with lockdown, everybody's sitting at home. Uh, the winery is closed. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, Durang Bay, Strandfontein, um, even Fredendal, where I, where I live, um, we, haven't, we don't have one corona um, infection yet so we pray and we hope that that will stay like that um, so we will probably see a little bit of a lift of the lockdown for people in our area uh, but according for wine sales i'm not sure as david said we're not sure what's going to happen so yeah that's a little bit of the background um, a little bit of the story um, arlo has been our, our uh, agent for quite some years um, yeah doing business quite quite eagerly with us Um, thank you for uh, this beautiful explanation. As you can see uh, on this uh, Google Earth slide, um, we are direct at the sea, um, and there's a big flat area before the mountains are coming, so a lot of winds are able to blow in. And what's very special is um, there's a pipeline directly from the sea cheering down the tanks because uh, the tanks for fermentation. Um, today, you're in the technical way, you understand that you need to chill them down during fermentation because the fermentation process is um, resulting in a lot of feed um, 
and if you don't kill the heat, you will uh, have not that perfect results in the wine uh, at the end. Um, as well, it can um, uh, manipulate the uh, style of fermentation and the speed of fermentation, of course. Um, but uh, you will lose some alcohol and you can't control any longer the fermentation process. So what's very unique, um, as I've seen, um, it's like a pipeline using the seawater, which is quite cold there, <laughs> not, not that warm, uh, just 10 to 15 degrees. And uh, seawater with 10 to 15 degrees is like perfectly suited to chill down the tank, so you don't need to chill it down on with a lot of energy. You just use what the nature gives you around, and that's very unique. And that, uh, I guess, if I'm right, why you're um, uh, located to this uh, outpost, I see, in the middle of the sea. Am I right? Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We, um, we, if you if you look at that photo that's up there. It looks as we as if we are in a little peninsula. We're into the ocean. It's a fantastic situation, uh, uh, place to be at, um, because it's uh, it's also very unique having a winery at sea level. But yes, the the temperature um, from the ocean is is very important for the whole from production of the of the uh, the grapes um, and into the winery. So. Um, but it's a it's a it's a big advantage to have that, um, uh, and it's for free. We don't have to we don't have to buy any of that coolness. It's there. It's just you just need to adapt to use it uh, to your advantage. Well, thank you for this explanation. And for me, this one is uh, one of the freshest, easiest drinking styles of uh, Shiraz I've ever tasted and like surprisingly good, uh, like chilled down to 10, 12 degrees, uh, getting a lot of fresh uh, aromas and not being um, uh, too heavy, but still being very complex. Um, and uh, Sabine is uh, just uh, skipping and asking, uh, why only 10 degrees to taste it? Because she feels the tunnels being very young and present on this uh, uh, temperature. Yeah, I hope you... Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, can you just repeat the question? I couldn't hear that question very well. Yes, the question was uh, about uh, why to drink this wine only with 10 degrees, because Sabine uh, felt the tannins being very young, very present, uh, very in front of uh, the taste. So why only 10 degrees Celsius to, to drink this wine? Okay, now the, the, the important thing is, um, um, it's not necessarily that it needs to be at 10 degrees. Um, the big difference between Europe and South Africa is that in Europe, the, the, the average temperature is most of the time lower than the average temperature in South Africa. So um, most of the time, people in Europe, I suppose, won't cool it down always. But this wine coming from close to the ocean, it, it likes to be, be cooler um, when, you, when you drink it. Um, because that, that relates more to the flavors that you have when, when, you, when you pick the berries, when you pick the, the, the grapes. So... Um, but yes, it will. It will give you. A, it's a. It's a very nice thing. At different temperatures, you will get a little bit of different flavors from the wine, but you get the most of that uh, kind of peppery notes when it's a little bit cooler. So, um, but it's not. It doesn't need to be exactly at ten degrees. You can. You can have it a little bit warmer, um, but I won't go below ten degrees. Then, um, uh, yeah, I hope I explained to her. Yes, I guess you explained perfectly. Yep. Mike um, just wrote that uh, he really likes the, the he finds the, the uh, Shiraz is very interesting, surprising especially, and uh, he compares it a little bit with the um, Beaujolais, a good Beaujolais, but more structured. Yeah, I think the the, 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 uh, the the structure we get out of that limestone layers that we have in the soil. 
um, because we see that there's a small part of the block that's um, that's not that much limestone. We we normally will will harvest that also separate to see what the difference is, and you always get that uh, better structure we, you get under limestone parts. Um, so I think that's a big help. Uh, without us doing anything, it was just it's in the soil. Okay. Well, let's switch over to the last one. We uh, gonna switch to uh, more than southern. Of course, we have been out to far north in South Africa. This one is from Swadland, one of the most important wine growing regions in South Africa as well. Long history. Um, it was used uh, for farmland uh, a long time ago, a lot of uh, uh, crop growing there. And um, what you shouldn't forget that uh, La South Africa is producing a lot of uh, raisins, like sultanines. Uh, what does mean uh, grapes not used for wine, but uh, used to, to be ate. Um, and that's so if you talk about <laughs> Uh, South African um, grape production always um, you need to relate to it. It's like you're facing only the grape production used for wine, not for sultanines or for, for table grapes. Uh, like a lot of uh, more warmer climate areas, there's a lot of wine, uh, grape growing only for table grapes or sultanines. That's a bit, di bit different than. than you're having this situation in Europe. Uh, in Europe, uh, nobody is uh, producing uh, raisins just to, to be ate. And um, the next place we are going is very unique. Just I longer. To interrupt. Uh, that. For me, it's the uh, place uh, to try natural wines from South Africa. Um, Perry is uh, controlling the uh, presentation. To go to the next slide, you're going to see we are switching directly into the mountains next to Citrus Dal. There you can see we have been with uh, Friars Cove and Doring Bank very far to the north. We are now a bit more to uh, the first area we have been to Schellenbosch, but uh, Svartland is a very big area and by far the best vineyards to try wines are located immediately in, immediately in midden to the mountains. There where you can find Tessalonga as well. Craig Hawkins uh, can explain the wines, but uh, for me, surprisingly, it was uh, to find Carignan in South Africa because Carignan, I love this grape too. We're going to try this one now, the Baby Bandito. Love this, this name, like Baby Bandito, why to call a wine Baby Bandito? Uh, um, Carignan, usually I know from France, very bold, packed with tannins, very intense, heavy. And not that easy understanding gravity, but uh, full with complexity, aromas, tannins, and for me, one of the hidden treasures usually from France, uh, but in this case is uh, from uh, South Africa, as we know. And um, he's declaring for himself to be all natural. And uh, this will be the first question to me, uh, uh, to you. Uh, what's all natural? Uh, because all natural is not like a fixed uh, term, and nobody can really describe what a very natural wine is starting, or what, what's the borders of natural wine. And um, yeah, maybe. We can explain a bit this and we're going to see. Okay, thanks, um, Shazad. Um, yeah, and David, nice to meet you guys. We haven't actually met in person, but uh, Arlo, Pierre, thanks for hosting all of this. Um, yeah, it's um, 
just to go straight into your question and then I'll give a bit of history about what we do. Um, you know, we started in, in 2008. I say we, it's my wife and I, Carla and I. Um, I started testing a <clears throat> with two barrels of skin macerated white one. I am answering your question, but it's just a bit of context. Um, and it was a skin macerated white wine. So, so what we call today orange wine. Um, and this is something that drew my fascination into wine. Is why I got in, not from a winemaking family. Um, I'm not from, so basically the advantages of that was I, I didn't have any um, preconceptions going into wine. It was all, everything was above board or everything was below board. It, it was a blank canvas. Um, and I, I have passports, so I travel a lot. I, I drink a lot. I taste a lot. I'm, I'm fascinated by wine and the people behind it and more particularly the, the vineyards. Um, and it was on one of the many travels and, and months I spent in Europe, France in particular. Um, France for me, um, I, I'm, because I'm not from the winemaking family, I wanted to, to tap into a bit of that history that the French and I found the old world has. Um, and I, I, I found this in, in France through traveling, first working a few vintages down south and then in the Rhone Valley and then I worked in Spain pretty actually was a great place, but it was in the Loire Valley in 2007 where I first tasted a wine that um, really captured my imagination. It captured for me the spirit of what I wanted in wine because at that stage um, I was ready to start making my own stuff. And uh, you know, the first question you ask yourself is, "Who are you, and <laughs> where are we going?" And you know, what do you want? What do you want to do? Is the is the simple thing. And I was quite. Um, I loved all the wines I tasted, some more than others, but there was nothing that really spoke to me um, on the volume that this particular wine did. And it happened to be a Sauvignon Blanc, actually, of all things, in the Loire Valley. It was um, a producer called uh, Junko Arai. She's now, she's Japanese, she's moved back to Japan, but her selling master at the time, they, they are now making their own wines. And I, I was with my brother and we both looked at each other and we were trying to understand why this wine is different. So. You know, we delved deeper into to asking a lot of questions, um, and and we found that it, it came back down to the vineyards, and and obviously, and also this was the first time I tasted a wine that was completely sulfur free, um, and had nothing added to it, um, and th that's when I realised, okay, this guy's something that interests me, something that I can get onto, and 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 to make it very clear as well, there there was still. A lot of quality in the wine. The wine is very high quality. Um, I drank my last bottle. It was two thousand um, a couple of years ago, um, and it was still perfect. And that just shows, you know, that these wines can age. Um, and then, and then I came back to South Africa and I started working for many different people. But at that stage, I was working for Ivan Sadi, who was at that stage and still is, uh, you know, at the forefront of of. Um, um, I would say new ideas, um, and it, he gave me the time to to express myself and do what I wanted to do, um, which I'm grateful for. Um, so I made a couple of barrels of, of wine then, um, but you know the, the whole natural thing. Um, <laughs> end of the day, it's about quality. Um, I get obviously because of what we fell into, um, it, the you know, and, and in the world at that stage, you know, life's about timing as well. Um, and, you know, we got into wine in 2008 and the, the whole natural wine movement kind of kicked off around then. The first natural wine phase that we got invited to was 2010. That was the, <coughs> the real wine fair in London. And then 2011, the raw started. And then we got invited to Ladiv and things like that. And it's a kind of like a network of, of people that uh, there's a different spirits in the wine. And I'm not saying one is better than the other at all. And that's actually the complete opposite. It's just, I was, I'm still fairly young now, but I was a lot younger back then, uh, you know, 25, uh, 26. And, and, you know, I just liked the, 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 the no pretenses to, to the wine. And it's more the city to the people around it. And there's the transfer of knowledge, which was, which was great. And I love vineyards and I love the farming, obviously. Um, and, and these guys were, that us converse French, Spanish, you know, they're a lot of my good mates now. They, they, you know, vineyard people. And uh, I absolutely, you know, fell in love with it. But 
to, to, to put a definition to it, what he uh, wants, um, and it's also what I also like about it is that there isn't a definition, but that we are, over time, things evolve and through conversation and through people doing their things, um, wines, you know, formed into place. So I think at the t now, the natural wine, back then I, I was going on the, on the, on the guidelines by Pierre jean -Cou. He started, he's got a website called More Than Organic. He, he's a very good connection friend to guys like Terry Puzula and the guys from the Wild Valley. Basically wines, natural wines, the first thing that we need is to be farmed organically. That's it, um, at least. And then um, the, the sellers, natural ferments, and obviously low sulfurs. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make a better wine. Um, and I think it's my role to, to intervene in certain stages um, to determine maybe I need more sulfur, maybe I even need less sulfur to make a better wine, or maybe I need to do a slight clarifying filtration. Or So that's it's, it's the kind of... Um, I think, um, I know that you want to discuss it, but normally the point of this conversation is I, I don't discuss natural wine at all uh, because I find people's eyes sometimes tend to glaze, glaze over. For me, it's just about making quality wine. And I find that working this way, I mean, David and Jan will attest to it as well, that, you know, the, the, the more hands off you go, the more um, your vineyard, it exposes poorer vineyard sites. Um, and your wines will, will reap the benefit for that for for, you know, the more you step back, the better. So we've made a lot of mistakes along the way and I've learned from those mistakes and they were crucial for our development. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's obviously now lockdown, there's uh, tough times for everybody involved and I think, um, yeah, the, the wine industry's in a, in, a, in a tricky place and I think we need to keep on, <laughs> no, now, uh, more than ever, keep on, keep on pushing and uh, keep on punching. So, uh, do you want to interrupt there or so carry on? Uh, well, um, it's a very good point you, you mentioned. Uh, keep on punching. Uh, for those who don't know, it's uh, one of the other wines uh, you're producing. It's like uh, one of your, um, sometimes you're like holding on. Um, it's a bit of your philosophy and I always uh, say if I'm talking to my customers um, uh, this wine like a uh, pure Carignan from South Africa is very unique um, but I would never mention it as uh, first to be a natural wine because for me there are a lot of uh, producers in the world especially since the boom of natural or uh, orange and organic wines, let's talk about all of them. Um, a lot of winemakers in the world should trying to do uh, a wine like this or a natural wine just to follow the mainstream. But this resulted in <laughs> a lot of very bad results. And uh, for me, the best uh, natural wine is uh, the one uh, where the winemaker or the producer don't mention it first. It's first about the wine, and after it, uh, about is it natural or organic or orange or whatever. Um, because uh, if you just try, if uh, people trust, try to make a natural wine because uh, the consumer is asking for, it won't result in a good wine. Uh, the for me the understanding of uh, producing in a natural good natural wine is um, having a philosophy and a uh, much deeper understanding and a bit an off-grid uh, understanding of the winemaking process because if you're reading books um, like i'm reading at the moment the uh, uh, microbiology of uh, making wine uh, all the books are uh, telling you uh, you can't do natural wine, uh, you know, high temperatures, long fermentation, bad results, and you will get a lot of faulty flavors. But you need to get back, step back. Um, there are a lot of wines made in the 19th century. We didn't have so many understanding of the technical way of how to produce and ferment. And the results of those wines are like, 
incredible good. So for me, the most accurate definition of a natural wine uh, is coming from uh, Odinsal, an uh, uh, organic and natural producer from Germany. And the winemaker there, he once said, well, uh, uh, what could be a definition of uh, natural wine? And he said, well, should be no added yeast, so it results in spontaneous fermentation. Uh, minimum impact of uh, added sulfur. Sometimes it's a natural product uh, you can't avoid, but uh, usually if you prepare wine quite well, there's not uh, enough sulfur to, prepare the, uh, to protect the wine. And um, as less as possible, uh, manipulation in the vineyard itself. And for this, uh, I said, well, for natural, it's a quite good explanation uh, to just let the nature grow because uh, a lot of people, they forget they're like hunting for labels, hunting for uh, the big labels in France. <laughs> All of you know them, paying a lot of money for wines, which are for sure in good quality, but sometimes I feel like they forgot about the philosophy about making wine. They're making a style and not making a wine. And that's for me a bit the freedom of natural and spontaneous fermentation wines and organic wines. I feel in all those three wines we have tried today, it's a bit more the freedom of being different in each vintage, each wine you're producing and uh, having a different philosophy and no need to rush to, to sell your bottles. All, the, all of you, David Trafford, Craig Hawkins and uh, Jan van Siel, you're having very small parcels, uh, not even one with more than 10 hectares, which is very, very small, uh, not even in Europe, but as well in South Africa, you don't produce too many wines and uh, you're still selling it, and uh, that's more the philosophy about wine and not being a label. No? I hope. Uh, great. Uh, are you asking me? What are you asking me? To the it was not a specific question, uh, yeah. but uh, the question could be uh, yeah. like: uh, You're trying to produce a wine, or you're producing a to trying to produce a style of wine. Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> look, I'm just trying to do... I'm trying to make the best I can make from that vineyard. Um, and I see there's a couple of questions here that I can answer, but I mean, that's... You know, just to kind of lay it to bed, but the, the whole thing with the natural is that a lot of people want it to be something that they are so they can also be included. It's, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you, there, there are definitions for it, and they, uh, you know, they're there. I mean, I don't quite agree with going, uh, you know, this, uh, making it too vague. Um, so, but at the end of the day, I'll, I'll answer for this one, uh, the Folly of Dreams. I see the, the questions on the, the, the size of the food um, can, yeah, can you hear me? Sorry, the, my line, my internet seems to have gone here. Yeah. You, you can. Yeah. There was a very interesting question from Wolfgang. He does ask, uh, why is the alcohol under 13% of alcohol comparison to the residual sugar? Um, yeah, look, it's under, so, okay, so we, uh, we we are hot. We are very warm climate. It's it's we call it. Um, we we the, particularly where this vineyard is. It's actually based quite far from the screen that you see. The image you see on your screen. That's a farm we bought in 2015, um, and we planted four hectares there. Um, where this vineyard is, is is 35 kilometers from the ocean on granite soils of of Malmesbury, um, the part of the area. So I I. I Pick, um, for me, I pick ripe. <laughs> Everyone's perception of ripe is different. Um, and I, I pick on acidity. So when, for me, the acid is balanced, I harvest. And I use the stems 
um, I use 100% stems to, to bring a perception of tannin into the wine. And uh, this is why my alcohols are, are relatively low. But for me, 12.8 is actually quite high compared to what I normally do. But um, the wines are, are bone dry and they're, and they're balanced. And um, I think this, this balance between acid and obviously bone dry and, and low alcohols, it, it help, and the tannins help the wine age a little bit. Uh, longer if necessary, but this wine is generally for drinking a bit earlier. Yes. Just to, to understand for everybody, like the baby bandito is made from the younger wines, so the uh, younger roots that uh, we are talking about. Um, but this, like, as all the wine, uh, root uh, or wine is getting um, as less crop it's producing, but as higher the aromas are concentrated. So we have two questions from Thomas and Sabina, um, but they're uh, a bit overlapping. Uh, the question uh, is, Thomas is saying, uh, your wines are very famous in Austria, and they love them. Uh, then Thomas and Sabina, they're both asking, please tell us more about your labels, where you get the ideas and the names uh, for the wines and the labels. Craig, can you still hear me? I think we lost Craig. I will switch off his video so that his uh, audio channel uh, has more power. Yes, this would be uh, would be an option. Um, try to get him back. Um, it seems that he jumped out. I hope he's coming back in a second uh, to answer the questions so yeah. far. So it seems that Thomas uh, might know more than only this wine from him. Um, the point is, for those who don't know those, this vineyard so close, all his wines having a very modern label and having very short, very uh, modern labels. Um, and that's why Thomas is asking about uh, to get the, the ideas. Uh, and Sabina is asking the same question. And um, I see I was asking as well that like, like um, this wine can be different uh, tasted from two different uh, shapes of glass and that's uh, usually a very big impact to, to your glass if you to the wine I'm sorry if you manipulate the size of a glass throwing it from a bigger or smaller glass um, it's a big impact of the to the wine because uh, you're manipulating, especially the speed, how fast the some of the aromas are evaporating into the air. So, especially for your for your uh, nose, it's a very big impact. But uh, after this, it can be an impact to to um, to the wine itself on your palate. Um, because you push the surface if the glass is getting bigger. So I see Craig Hawkins is back by yep. audio. You can try. Yeah, sorry. About yes. That. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, Africa. <laughs> Internet on the mountain. Yes, up and up. <laughs> no, we are very happy having you back. Um, did you hear my last question or not? Yes, I did. About the labels. Yes, about the labels and the names. And the names, yes. yes. Sorry about that. It's we long story about our internet, but sometimes it doesn't work. Um, yeah, so the labels I do myself, it's all um, uh, photos either I've taken, my brother in this instance took this photo, or uh, friends, or my wife took some photos. So I, I make, I actually make about 18 different wines, which is a lot. Um, for me, the labels is a, is a real um, uh, outlet for me. I love art. I did art at school and things, and it's, it's helped me actually get into university. My grades weren't very good at science and stuff, but um, I, I love the creative side of um, 
this for me is the great the side I really love. Um, so it's 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 a photo. Art. I like all art, but I like street art. It just I like bright colors and I like things that basically I like labels that give you an emotion. For me, wine tasting is um, when you looking at a wine, you must, it's, it's another dimension. You look at a label and it must also give you an emotion or a feeling. Um, and, and generally I like to make people smile. Um, so that generally when people look at the label, they will immediately feel something or they will smile. Um, some people don't smile, they just turn away, but that's the, the problem. Um, but it's all about being positive um, for the baby bandito. So we have baby bandito and then we have El bandito, which is the, um, to put in uh, use of a better word, the baby Benito's like my village crew, and then the old Benito's just the vineyards that are a little bit better than the uh, that I give me the more complex ones. Um, and you know, I have keep on punching, I have stay brave. Uh, I'll hold it up here, you can see that's a stay brave, I keep on punching, and then I've got another one called Ch and then the follow your dreams. So, follow your dreams is a quote obviously made famous by Banksy. Um, and plagiarized around the world, which is also cool for him. I think it's what he wanted to do. And uh, I just, it's a very strong uh, message. And I think more, no more appropriate than in times like this. So um, we started it when we moved to the farm, um, these, these labels. And I think it was a bit of a homage to that, just to just keep on doing what we're doing. <clears throat> That's it. <laughs> Yeah, um, there was one more question. Um, maybe it's a question more than correct. You can answer it, but it's more a question generally about uh, wine producing. Um, at your wine, the description says it's made in a 3,500 liter barrel. So yes. the question is, What's the impact about the size of the barrel to the resulting wine? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I... Um, uh, well, I guess uh, he's roll. up again. I like bigger, older barrels. Um, so these barrels in particular have... Uh, so they're all the brandy barrels. They're about 50 years old. Uh, I bought them from KWV, which is a, um, a big, uh, what's the word, like the old wine industry uh, in South Africa, the KWV. Um, sorry, I just went blank there. But they, I had them refurbished by a, a barrel cooper and then um, I had them used. I like, I like, I don't want the wood to give a, but I need to give, like David said, um, it's a vessel for holding the wine, but I like it to give a little bit of oxygen. So basically, the bigger the wood uh, gives you less oxygen, the thicker the wood, and the smaller the barrels give you more oxygen. It's just uh, science. Um, but in this particular case, I like it with the carrying gun. It keeps it quite tight. Um, carrying gun is an extremely difficult grape to work with. Uh, it can go very reductive. It can go stinky, but I like the wine in a in in larger vessel. I just find it keeps it tight for longer. Um, and they're also cool to look at. I'm sorry. Uh, one more question. Thomas says uh, it's more philosophical question. I give the question first to David. He was the first uh, uh, winemaker today. So the question is to all of you of the winemakers. Uh, is there any specific dish or plate you would like to compare your wine we have tried today with? David, you, you're the first. Is there any uh, specific plate you would like to see your Chenin Blanc? Oh, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, any seafood. Uh, Chenin Blanc is, is extremely versatile. Um, when, and I think our style with a little bit of wood and, and that kind of creaminess that can go nicely with, with chicken as well. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say specifically, um, but we, especially in our warm climate, um, we tend to, it's the only white wine we do. So we actually tend to have it with 
with quite a lot of different foods um and and it and it goes you know it goes well but i would say you know some little bit of creaminess it can take a little bit of a thai spice like just a small amount um but yeah so you know kind of seafood fairly rich uh, fish or or lightish seafood dish goes well with it yeah well that's very good su suggestion yes jan uh, same question to you about your shiraz from Doring bay what's the bay you would like to com uh, combine it just a moment i guess jan your microphone is still uh, off so there i'm yep there i'm on again okay now the the, the shiraz goes very well with roast beef um uh, ribs you can uh, pair it with with uh, spicy sausages um even with your with your hard cheeses um yeah that's the kind of kind of food that will go with that and i saw there's a there's a Something uh, about um, uh, how does sommeliers take that dis uh, decision or pairings, which the winemakers sometimes put on their labels or pair the wine with. Um, I think normally when, when, when it is necessary, a sommelier will ask the winemaker what's his suggestion. And then they normally try that, that kind of um, that, uh, pairing and they will agree or they will say, you no, know, they think they will shift to something else. But most of the time, um, we as winemakers or wine drinkers, we try a lot of things with, with different wines. And most of the time, you try it two or three times, and then you know that's the kind of dish that goes with your wine. So um, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I guess you did, yes. Uh, well, it's funny because for me, it's... Uh, Uh, usually exactly the opposite. I try a lot of wines during fairs, uh, like in, in Germany or uh, Europe boys, I'm like trying wines like every day or wherever I am. And um, if I try a dish, if I'm sitting in the kitchen discussing with uh, the chef, new menu, a new place, I get an idea of what I would like to drink uh, together with this. So for me, it's mostly exactly the opposite way. I, first, uh, in, my, in, my, in my job, I know first the place, plate, first I know the dish, and then I say, okay, I need this, and this one, and for those who know me very well, sometimes if I'm free, I don't even place wines by this or something else, something crazy stuff. Uh, well, it's, Interesting um, that you say you, you would first uh, ask somebody to, to compare your wines with. Uh, for me, for me, it's a bit different. Uh, I try to. For me, it's more about to either contrast or balance a plate or wine if if I need to, to combine it. But same question to you, Craig. Uh, what's your favorite dish you would like to see your wine with? Basically, um, whatever you got in the fridge at home is, is generally good. But uh, I, I like any, my favorite is lamb chops on the, on the fry. Uh, generally, the fat that you get um, with that meat, I, I just love uh, anything oily or fatty with this particular wine, purely because of uh, the acidity that, and the tannin that you in the wine. I think they balance quite well. So. Even for that case, you could even use some fish if you wanted to with a, with a, a rich sauce. But um, yeah, definitely, definitely for me, meat though. But um, some of us are, can't be too picky with what we've got at home. So generally what you got <laughs> and, and a good friend. <laughs> well, for me always it's like to combine a wine with food is like just combine whatever you would like to eat. But for me, I chose the wine. The first idea was like to have three wines comparing to one dish. That was the first idea because, but now uh, it got a bit more too complex with all of you, of the winemakers uh, being present. I'm very thankful of this. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to all of three. 
for being present, taking the time to expand your wines and your vineyards uh, today. Um, my first idea, uh, how I selected the wines was very simple and uh, like uh, an idea how to prepare food <laughs> during lockdown. I was thinking about uh, having a very simple uh, ribeye uh, grilled together with some potatoes made uh, in the oven and uh, some, um, some, I'm missing the word uh, <laughs> in English. Uh, in French it's fromage blanc, uh, it's quite good German, but like I cheese. It in English. Uh, well, and um, well, that was the idea first, uh, and I guess all the three wines um, are very perfect to this dish. Um, whoever is online, please contact me in a private chat after this tasting. I guess we are done with all the wines. Again, thanks a lot for you, Pear, to do all the technical moderation, to taking care about everything is going very well. I just check if we have to my question, I guess, yes. No, it was a comment of Elke. You were thinking of sauce pernaise, maybe. Uh, <laughs> no, not sauce pernaise, just like uh, kräuter quark. What's kräuter quark in English, I guess? Just say kräuter quark. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, seems to be so easy. Well, uh, that's it. And uh, Arlo, Thank you for taking the time and uh, organizing that all the winemakers are online. And um, if you have any comments uh, how we can improve this uh, tasting or if we should do it again or not, or if you said, oh, it was too boring, please let us know. Um, let me know, maybe you can do it again, even if, um, Corona lockdown is done, or if you continue, let us know. Maybe we're going to organize a second one or not. You're going to see. Let us know. And all of you, we so hope you had a good time. We, we just started the, the poll you were talking of, um, who liked the tasting format and what we can do better. And um, for your question, uh, Elke said, just say sour cream. Sour cream, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. It's so easy. <laughs> Just ask ask the specialists. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Elke. Elke is, of course, yes. Austrians say Thanks, no. Man. For what? It should be curd cheese, can be. No? Okay, the poll is uh, developing. We're already at 61% of people having answered. Um, I also have to do, otherwise we will never have. Okay, I've done it. So we're <coughs> a few more people who are answering in the moment. And yeah, um, von meiner Seite auch ein, ein riesen Dankeschön, a very, very big uh, thank you to all the winemakers taking the time on a Sunday uh, evening, Sunday late afternoon, because it's the same time over there, down there in, in South Africa. It was a fantastic tasting, I think. And I think it was very good that we only had, only had three wines, because we could really go deep into the wines themselves. We could have a good chat with the winemakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arlo, for sending out all the wines, for taking <coughs> this uh, part. Thank you, Shazad, for, yeah, for the idea and organizing it in, in that part of the world. Thank you. Hello. Thank you huh? And thanks to South Africa. All the best, guys. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks a lot. Yes, yes thank, thank you, you, everybody, for Great joining. Yes, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. So, jetzt habe ich gerade noch die ähm, Umfragewerte eingeteilt, also äh, eingeblendet. Mit 42 Prozent sehr gut, 42 Prozent gut, liegen wir, glaube ich, verdammt gut dabei. 
Äh, was können wir verbessern? 60 Prozent sagen nichts. 42 Prozent werden dann ihre Verbesserungsvorschläge in die F&As schreiben. Die lasse ich noch so lange offen. Also insofern äh, bin ich mal gespannt, was da noch kommt. Das ist doch gut. Ja. Also. Damit es nicht so langweilig wird, werde ich jetzt mal ein bisschen Musik einblenden, ähm, damit wir auch ein bisschen Spaß haben, während wir... Perfekter, perfekter Chat-Moderator. <lacht> Ja, uh, leider. Uh, nee, das sind nur noch zwei, also vielen Dank auch, dass du mitgemacht hast. Und, uh, ja. Ah, ähm, ups. Sehr, interessante, ähm, sehr interessantes Comment von Sabine, Speaker-Ansicht öfter. Ähm, Wobei der, der Speaker war letztendlich, ich habe es ja hier selber verfolgt auf dem kleinen Bildschirm, äh, war immer mitzusehen. Also wir hatten äh, auf der einen Seite die Folie, die eingeblendet war und dann war der Speaker immer gleichzeitig zu sehen. Also ich weiß nicht, was da äh, war. Leider konnte ich nicht alle Teilnehmer sehen, gibt es nur vier Bildschirme. Ah, okay. Ähm, Schausser, du musst dein Mikrofon. Das kann man äh, manuell umstellen. Also es gibt eine, die Speaker-Ansicht kann man wiederum umstellen. Äh, da ist ein Raster-Modus drin oder ein Listen-Modus. Und je nachdem, welchen Modus man anstellt, ja. äh, kann man mehr oder weniger Speaker sehen. Da, da ist ja kleine Haken drin. Ich, ich werde mal die Fragen hier noch äh, schriftlich beantworten. Ich denke, die Leute werden da vielleicht noch reingucken. Ähm nicht alle Teilnehmer sehen, okay. Das ist wahrscheinlich bei der Elke, dadurch, dass sie später dazu kam, nicht klar geworden, dass es ein Webinar ist, dass nur wir zu sehen sind. Führung auf den Weingütern. Eieiei. Das wäre natürlich ein technischer Aufwand, jetzt mit dem Handy da rumzugehen und, und live Führung zu machen. Nein, das liegt an ein bisschen anderen Problem, einfach weil die Regionen und die Weingüter jetzt nicht so populär sind, auch wenn sie sehr gut sind. Also äh, das ist ja immer so ein bisschen äh, die Frage kommt von Sabine, ist ja, gehört ja auch zu den Professionals. Ähm, die Frage ist immer, sind die Weingüter interessant für uns äh, als Professionals, als die, die auch die Weine äh, von mir aus gesehen zumindest in Restaurants und Vergessen repräsentieren müssen, interessant oder gehören zu den Gehören sie zu den Top-Weingütern der Welt? Und äh, letzteres muss ich ganz klar sagen, nein, weil sie unter dem Radar fungieren. Und wenn so etwas äh, nicht von Interesse, Weltinteresse ist, sage ich mal, dann wird das Google garantiert nicht merken. Ähm, darum war das mit Führung auf den Weingütern jetzt virtuell einfach nicht möglich. Ähm, wenn ihr, wenn du, Sabine, vor Ort seid, dann schreibt den Weingütern einfach oder fragt Arlo oder mich nach den Kontakten, die können wir gerne herstellen. Aber jetzt virtuell war es einfach nicht möglich, weil es nicht weit genug gemappt ist. Wenn wir jetzt in Europa sind, da ist alles mit Google Street View gemappt, da kann man direkt auf die Weingüter gehen. Das ist gar kein Problem, aber dort ist das nicht so möglich. Das liegt einfach an der Region ein bisschen und an dem, ich sag mal, an, der, an dem weltweiten Interesse im Zusammenhang. Nochmal ganz kurz zu der Frage von Elke. Äh, leider konnte ich nicht alle Teilnehmer sehen. Ähm, es ist so, wir haben das Ganze als Webinar gemacht äh, und nicht als klassisches Zoom-Meeting. Ähm, das machte es uns einfacher, äh, die ganze Kontrolle hier zu haben. Es macht uns einfacher, ähm, da die Folien einzublenden, äh, die Folie, wobei gleichzeitig der, der, der Speaker zu sehen war. Wir konnten diese Umfragen machen. Ähm, das geht bei den äh, Chats oder bei den klassischen Meetings nicht ganz so. Vor allem dann ist es halt manchmal auch die Problematik, dass die, die ähm, Mikrofone nicht ausgeschaltet werden. Deswegen haben wir dieses Format gewählt und deswegen waren halt immer nur die Leute zu sehen. Ansonsten gibt es auch immer die Möglichkeit, ähm, ähm, umzuschalten auf, die, auf den Vollbildmodus, um dann noch mehr zu sehen. So. Da war noch eine Frage von Sabine mit den alten großen Fässern. Ähm, das könnte man sicherlich für die nächste Zeit vorbereiten. Ähm, in dem Sinne haben wir jetzt für dieses Testing 
äh, mit den Weingütern nicht im Detail äh, abgesprochen, was wir zeigen wollen und werden, äh, sondern wollten das ganz bewusst eher offen lassen, auch in dem Sinne, dass die Weingüter sehr entspannt und ähm, sagen wir mal, due to äh, Corona in Homeoffice-Atmosphäre einfach erzählen konnten, was sie erzählen wollten. Darum wussten wir die die Diäten Spots ist nicht vorab, sonst hätten wir das natürlich gerne eingeblendet. Das ist klar. Und nochmal ganz kurz zu Wolfgang. Äh, Format sehr gut, äh, Weinmacher direkt dabei zu haben. Ähm, ja, es, es war teilweise wirklich eine Herausforderung. Wir haben es ja gemerkt, beispielsweise beim David, wo zwischendurch immer wieder diese Verzögerungen, diese, diese äh, Sprünge zu hören waren. Die Internetverbindung dort ist nicht immer wirklich perfekt. Und das merkt man dann halt gerade bei so einem Stream sehr deutlich. Und ja, wir müssen versuchen, alle daran zu arbeiten. Es ist für viele von uns ein, ein neuer Bereich, wie man klar und deutlich rüberkommt, wie man auch mit der Helligkeit gut rüberkommt. Ihr, ihr seht, ich habe hier ein bisschen Gas gegeben. Ich habe hier extra, ich mache es mal ganz kurz aus, ich habe extra eine Lampe so positioniert, dass ich besser zu sehen bin. Ich habe virtuelle Hintergründe. Also ich sitze hier nicht gerade. Ich sitze auch nicht in dem Büro, das ihr seht, sondern das ist einfach alles Technik, was im Hintergrund läuft. Bloß die, die mich kennen, die wissen, ich bin so ein Verrückter. Ich, ich liebe Technik. Und insofern, ja, ich bin auch gespannt, was, was Wolfgang schreibt. Ja, er ist sehr gespannt auf den... den Chat dann oder auf die, die Geschichte mit, mit Libanon, die wir am Donnerstag, Freitag haben. Donnerstag, glaube ich. Und insofern, ja, da werden wir auch versuchen, wieder eine Schippe draufzulegen. Aber jetzt sind wir erstmal bei Südafrika. Also mir persönlich hat es viel Spaß gemacht und, und ähm, ich bin sehr gespannt, wie das alles weitergeht und freue mich, wenn wir das noch viel öfter machen können. Das hoffe ich da auch und äh, interessant wäre es auf jeden Fall äh, und vielleicht ist äh, Corona nur dafür gut, uns neue äh, Ideen zu geben, äh, wie wir kom kommunizieren können und äh, wenn wir ohne zu reisen äh, über die ganze Welt vernetzt sein können, wenn nicht das äh, das Ergebnis ist, äh, was dann? Also ist auch nicht schlecht, oder? Ja, schaut seit meine Worte. Es bringt nichts, den Kopf in den Sand zu stecken. Wir sind gegen die Wand gelaufen, gegen diese Wand, die sich Covid-19 läuft. Es hat weh getan, es tut uns allen weh. Einmal laut Scheiße schreien, aufrappeln, wieder nach vorne gucken und neu orientieren oder justieren und dann weitermachen, positiv denken. Ich denke, das ist ganz, ganz wichtig. Wir müssen einfach das, was unsere Natur ist, was, was unser Herz ist, die Gastlichkeit, die Empathie, die müssen wir weiterhin aufrechterhalten, um einfach ja, wohl auf zu sein und dann so schnell wie möglich ähm, ja, weiterzumachen. Ich glaube, das war ein äh, gutes Schlusswort und äh, in dem Sinne würde ich sagen, Vielen Dank äh, an alle, die dabei waren und ich sehe, es sind immer noch äh, elf dabei. Also äh, vielen Dank auch an euch, die äh, jetzt bis zum Schluss durchgehalten haben ähm, und äh, bis bald, hoffentlich zum nächsten Mal. Bis ganz bald und zum Ausstellen noch ein bisschen Musik. Musik